Yo, my g'day and welcome to Floriard Reimagined. This is Let's Talk and I'm Dan Borsch and it's great to have you along. As we navigate these unusual times, we have a very small but eager audience right here as part of Floriard Reimagined, taking into account all sorts of COVID-19 precautions of physical distancing, but remaining socially connected. And of course, all of our new precautions around hand sanitizer and the like. Before I begin today, I want to pay my respects to the Ngunnawal traditional custodians for their maintenance of the culture, the storylines, the song lines, and the mother earth of this environment where we live today. We're going to be having a discussion about how the earth nurtures us back. So it's even more important that we reflect upon that, I think. And I, I want to pay my respects to those custodians who have been so generous uh, with welcoming me to their land because I'm from far, far away from here. I also want to acknowledge uh, our sponsors. Events like this don't happen by themselves. Uh, the ACT government, of course, the major sponsor, of the National Capital Authority, uh, also the Canberra Centre for being a partner of Floriad Reimagined again this year. It's great to have them back on board. And right where we're coming to you from, the national circuit. Thanks very much to everyone who's been involved. And we are talking about, well, how the earth can sustain us. And I've got a great panel today. Uh, we're, we're talking about bush food, medicine, foraging in our area. Adam Ship and Tracy Bull both live here in Canberra. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with you, uh, Adam. Your company, Eurobuy, is about reflecting on the land, what's around us and what we can take, but also what we can give back. What drives you? Yeah. Um, well, growing up as a Radri man, uh, my, my father's people from Dubbo originally, but growing up here on Ngunnawal country in, in Canberra, um, always sort of, uh, you know, connected to our culture and, and country. And, um, you know, I, I think what drives me today is um, the real, I guess, um, keenness out there for everyone to kind of connect to our culture and, and to learn it um, you know because when I was in school um, you know we um, kind of all met together you know the Aboriginal students and we, we would do lots of um, obviously activities together but there wasn't every any sort of emphasis on any of our um, you know our perspectives and, and learning growing up and um, to see, I guess, the way it's changed over the last sort of 10 years, it's been, it's really exciting for me to see that kind of, um, yeah, that, like I said, that keenness out there to learn about all of this stuff. And so Eurobuy, my business, is really showcasing our traditional plants and plant use, um, which I've been lucky to learn from Ngunnawal and Wiradjuri um, elders over the many years. Um, and so this is kind of where I'm at today, is showcasing this through education with schools, working with my own people and um, trying to facilitate that healing on country with my own people and um, and then working with the broader public here in the ACT. Yeah, I want to come back to the healing on country part in a moment, but you talked about the, uh, this renewed appetite and interest. Uh, what do you think driving that? Yeah, look, I think um, I think the whole, yeah, as you touched on earlier, the whole world is sort of changing. We're changing and we're, we're starting to look um, at you know, what's in our own backyard and the importance of what's out there, um, you know, and utilising what's out there a bit more. And um, so I think people are really interested in the foods that have been here for thousands of years and continue to, um, you know, grow across this landscape. Um, and I think it's kind of really now with everything that's happened, um, particularly not just with COVID, but with all the... Um, you know, the fires and floods and things that we were seeing, you know, our um, climates are changing and it's really important to look at the things that are still, you know, um, thriving out there on country and um, have sustained themselves for, for thousands of years. And maybe, you know, what I would love to see um, my business, um, as, as my business kind of um, eventuate too, is see more people using these foods in their everyday diet um, and incorporating it back into their everyday diet. So, Well, I think that's the aim from today that we're going to learn how to do yeah. just that from, from both of you. Uh, Tracy, you grew up on a farm in Goulburn, uh, being in touch with the land and how to have that sustainable relationship has been key to your journey. What is it that drives you though? Um, I love being outside. I love being connected to the landscape. I like to share things with people 
and I really enjoy um, cooking and preparing foods and sharing that with people and to be able to do that with things that you've foraged for just um, brings a whole new element to it and I really care about the landscape and trying to nurture the earth um, and trying to put back some of what we're taking away and by gardening and foraging um, it's a way of um, connecting with the earth and um, trying to learn how it functions uh, and getting in the wildlife as well is really important to me um, so yeah I guess it feels natural yeah and I want to share that with people well on that point about sharing it just how important and, and how does it feel for you when you're breaking bread with family and friends on with dishes that you may have foraged or that there's been a, a pathway of sustainability around? Yeah, I love it. Um, and everyone really enjoys it as well, especially when you tell them that it's something yeah, from a parkland or something that people associate with as being um, a pest in the garden and things like that. And you can eat it and it can actually taste good. Yeah. Uh, on that point, Adam, how do we know the difference? How do we start to decipher the environment of what is might be seen to be a pest uh, if I, I'm looking and don't understand the land, as opposed to something that might actually give have that thing give that thing back to us? Mm, yeah. Look, that's a good question, and I think that you know. Um a lot of what we're going to learn about here today too, you know, they, they are serving a function in the landscape, even if they have been introduced or that they're um, spreading and they're, you know, they're serving a function um, that, you know, maybe some of these original plants that I'm going to talk about were serving, but um, have dropped out of the landscape. And so these other ones have sort of moved in. Um, but, you know, um, some people look at it, them as pests and weeds and things like that, but you you know if you look at them with new eyes and look at um, how they can actually benefit it, the earth or benefit us as well, um, you kind of start to think of them a little bit differently. So um, I don't know. It's kind of uh, it's a good question um, how to decipher what is and what isn't. Um, but I think you know at the end of the day, um, yeah. For, for me, it's just looking at it with open, op more open eyes. Um, you know, for us, our mother, like who Rodri, we call it Mother Nunjanatia, our Mother Earth, she um, provides for us, provides the abundance. And whether that's our traditional foods or these introduced foods that are coming in, when you look at it that way, you actually see how much abundance is out there and how much food is there and medicines and stuff for us. So, um, so we always give thanks to her. Um, regardless of what we're picking and collecting so yeah, yeah. and that's that thing uh, the, the two ways isn't it of, yeah. of taking something but also giving something back that's correct yeah yeah and and only you know one thing that um very special elder who's taught me a lot of stuff is one thing that always resonates with me is take what you need and not what you greet and we always go by that philosophy we never take everything from from the one plant and that that's including the things that you know, you're going to talk about today too, like um, everything that has a purpose and, you know, whether it's a food for an insect or an animal and things, you don't go and just harvest the whole thing, take it for yourself. And, um, you know, that's part of our philosophy. Mm. And, and Tracy, because there are inherent risks, aren't there? Like we know with mushrooms, there are some that you just can't touch. I, I wonder, well, I imagine that that applies across the board, doesn't it? It does. It's really important um, with foraging for foods that you do your research um, potentially be shown by other people and be without doubt um, know what that plant is because there are toxic plants out there but there's also plants that may um, be affected from contamination in the soils and in the air and things like that as well so it's very important that you look into it a lot uh, beforehand and that you're really sure of the identity of a plant. Well, I think that point about the research and listening to those who know what they're talking about leads us perfectly to some of the items you've both got. Let's bounce back and forth and get, have you pick something that you've each brought and, and tell us about that, Adam. I'll start with you. All right. Well, one that's um, poking up all over the place at the moment, um, and you're going to see it around the cotter, you're going to see it out at in places in Tuggeron, in many of our, our reserves around. Um, doesn't look like much at the moment this one because this is just a little one i've brought out from my yard 
um, but it's um, it gets many names: bush leek or bush onion. Um, in Radri, we call it galagang, and it's got this beautiful bulb. It's a bulbine lily, um, and so you might be able to see that little bulb there. Um, this is really yummy, Tucker. This is um, basically like potato in flavour when you roast it. Um, kids love it. We roast them up. It's like potato chips, basically. Although looking small, they do um, get a lot bigger um, if grown in the right environment um, and the, the right soils and stuff. Um, and what they'll actually do is these bulbs will actually um, kind of uh, multiply. And so you're pulling out um, quite some you know, substantial bulbs over time um, as the size of a tomato, basically. Um, there's a really good spot, you know, f um, very important place for the Ngunnawal people that I've been um, privileged to sort of been learn about and, and um, go up to. And it's a grinding groove site in Tuggeranon. And so the grinding grooves are, are where our seeds are ground and made into flour, but it's also a place where um, we were sharpening our tools, so stone axes and um, spearheads and things. And all around that site, um, the stone site, is food like this. The bulbine lily, um, chocolate lily, um, a very important edible grass called a kangaroo grass, which um, provides an edible seed. Um, and so it's not by co you know, coincidence. It's, it was purposely managed over many, many, many thousands of years, the land, to grow these plants. And they're still growing there today. And um, you kind of get a feeling when you get up there um, you know that the old people, they were sitting there, they were working um, in their sort of kitchen space or their working space and they were looking out onto their beautiful gardens and this is just, um, as far as the eye can see, um, the bulbine lily. Telling yeah, Telling stories. And telling stories and collecting the foods and um, bringing it back and having it as a really nice sort of family space where everyone was there and um, camping and stuff and having so a good time. W with this one, how do you know when is the time to be pulling that up? Pulling them out. Yeah, that's a good um, question. So um, over autumn is a good period and, and into winter and also um, parts of spring. You know, generally with the flowers coming up, um, you can pull them up, but we generally try to keep them when they're flowering in the ground because they want to um, produce more seed and produce more of the plants. Um, and that's the biggest thing with, I guess, I mean, we say it with indigenous foods, but like all over, traditionally it was all um, across the world, everything was seasonal. You know, now we've gotten used to going into a supermarket and getting what we want all year round, like a tomato in the middle of winter or whatever, all year round. But um, all these foods are seasonal and they were eaten at certain times of the year. Um, so this plant is basically just the, um, the leaves over sort of the autumn um, period, the winter periods and things. Um, into spring they they do shoot up that flower um, they then dry out the flower dries out produces the seed over the really hot months they actually dry back and die back into the ground so you'd think if you're growing them in your garden you think they're gone they're dead and you've done something but then if you wait a little bit um, into the cooler months um, the cooler nights start coming in around march april they start poking up their head again into the soil um, that you've got them in. So, um, so yeah, don't be you know disappointed if they die over summer. Um, that's the same with our myrnong, the yam daisy, and many of our other plants. They sort of um, that have these root vegetables. They're smaller plants. They sort of die back a little bit. Not always. Like if you keep the water up to them in a garden, they will keep shooting up, but they'll get a little bit smaller and stuff. So, so yeah. So um, you know that's. I guess some of the timing that you would collect them and things. Um, really, really good tucker, like I said. So, would, you, yep. would you, after you take them up, would you cut the top off and, and replant yep. it? Or if, or if you, like you said, there are a number of bulbs there, yep. would you leave some in the ground? Very much so, yeah. yeah. I'm glad you, you brought that up. Yeah, these plants are really regenerative. So, um, you know, particularly the myrnong, the yam daisy, you just put leaves back in the ground, they'll reshoot. Um, they'll reshoot these um, they will but they do like to have a few of these little roots maybe just um, stuck back in with it so if you can harvest around get the bulb and chuck some of the leaves and some of the small roots back in they'll reshoot um, so uh, they're really um, regenerative plants um, we also sometimes say you know yeah if you pull up a few bulbs you take the grandmother 
um, and you put back the babies kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, that was, that's another sort of thing that we, we look at and that we do when we're harvesting is we take the bigger, the larger ones, the smaller ones go back into the ground. So, um, these are, you know, really high in our minerals and stuff, you know, calcium and iron and, um, good contents of minerals and the more and more places like CSIRO and research, um, you know, universities and stuff are looking at these foods. They're all superfoods. They're all coming back superfoods. Um, and it's really, you know, when you look back at our old people in the photos, totally ripped with, you know, eight to 12 packs <laughs> that I'll <laughs> never have. Um, you know, it's because of these traditional diets and these traditional foods. Um, so um, I actually have a good friend of mine uh, in Dubbo at the moment. Um, he's doing it like totally trying to eat totally um traditional foods for a week and he's already got an eight pack wow in four days so like he was already pretty fit but <laughs> he's actually developing it all now just i want to read on. the book that he writes yeah yeah <laughs> just um living on the traditional foods out there for um for a few days so it's amazing how quickly it changes and how quickly your health changes by um, embracing these foods and starting to eat them yeah so much to be said yeah. for that uh, tracy what, what's one that you want to highlight um, in here I have common plantain. Uh, there's a few different varieties of it around um, and both the foliage and um, the seed heads are edible. Generally with weeds you'll go for ones that are quite lush and young and if you can go for ones that are a lighter green because often um, weeds can be a little bit on the bitter side. Um, now with the plantain it's quite nutritious as are all um, edible weeds um, and there's a lot of soluble fibre in the seed heads um, so you can um, mush these up and put them in your cooking and they taste a little bit like mushroom. And you'd want to be cutting that quite fine or using some sort of a, like a mortar and pestle, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's not something um, texturally that would be enjoyable if it was whole um, as it is. Yeah, it is good broken up. And in terms of uh, that one in particular, is now the right time to be consuming that? Yeah, so um, this time of year is really good for foraging because there's um, water in the ground and it's earlier in the season so it's not too hot. Um, so the growth is usually quite good and it's a good time to um, be um, going foraging for edible weeds, yeah. And you were saying some of the leaves can be eaten as well? Yeah, the leaves can be eaten as well. Um, plantain can be a little bitter, so that's where it's really important to go for the really young growth. So look for ones that aren't actually flowering yet and also go for ones that are the lighter green. Um, what you can do too is um, soak a lot of these leafy greens for about five minutes in hot water. That helps to get some of, um, if it's got oxalic acid in it, it helps to get a bit of that out and also a bit of the intensity. And also by cooking them or stir frying them um, with other um, foods, they um, complement them well. Whereas if you had a feed of this by itself, it'd be pretty intense. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it could actually add uh, in small amounts quite a bit of flavour and quite yeah, a different yeah, sort of flavour. Yeah, different elements to it. Yeah, for sure. What about the yellow flowers? So um, this is um, a variety of brassica, um, which our cabbages and cauliflowers and things stem from. Um, there's actually quite a few different species growing around the place. Um, and this one's known as wild cabbage. So again, um, the foliage is edible and quite tasty. And it does taste a lot like um, a young um, broccoli or something like that, the leaves. So it's important again to get it before it starts to flower like this because it all tastes quite pungent. So you go for the young ones. And is there a point that the plant would tell you that it's ripe? So is there something that happens perhaps before the flowering? Um, not ripeness wise, like with these things, um, they don't necessarily need to be ripe like a piece of fruit to taste good. Um, it's going for them when they're really young. So the younger, the better. And when they're immature, yeah, much better flavour. And where would you find those two? Um, so this one was on the Monaro Highway on my way here. Um, so I parked my car and um, went and grabbed it. 
couldn't get it near home. It on the yeah, way. <laughs> yeah. I was looking for it at home, but they'd mowed um, the last day or two. So, but I managed to find one on the highway. Um, but you do, um, as I'd mentioned, need to be mindful of contaminants. So where you harvest or whether they've been sprayed, but you'll easily find these in parklands or even in your own backyard, especially um, immature specimens of it. What's, what's another one that you want to highlight for us, Adam? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll try and find it here. And, you know, um, real professional have it in a little bag here. But um, And I'm dropping everything. So one that gets planted as a street tree everywhere, you've probably seen it, Currajong. Um, so Currajong's a local tree as well. Um, the Magi National Park has some really nice specimens of it or hope hope they're still out there. I've been to some parts since the fires and there are still some there. Um, but um, in terms of the smaller trees, um, there's, there's quite a lot of smaller trees planted um, as street trees all around the ACT. Um, actually, forest is a good place up um, in one of the more wealthy suburbs to find a whole bunch of them. Um, so... You might see in there, and probably can't at the, um, out there, but there's there's all these little seeds. Um, I actually harvest a whole bunch of them um, when I was back home in Dubbo at the start of the year in January. I, I spent maybe um, 20 minutes on one tree and got half a wool pack full of seed seed pods. It doesn't take you long, and I've had seeds ever since for, for the rest of the year. So do you want to try one? I've got... Got sure, one here. Yeah, sure. yeah, I can um, so, try and so be COVID safe and, and <laughs> open them and just drop it onto your hand. So, so what what um, are they? What are they for? Like, would you have these as part of other dishes? Um, yeah. So the currajong is like one of our um, traditional grains. So it was ground up in those dishes that I mentioned. Um, it'd be ground up, whether it's a um, permanent dish in the ground or the ones that um, particularly the women would carry around with them, the grinding dishes. Um, and it was ground up into a flour um, and then made into like a damper or a bread. So um, I'll give you one there to try if I can get one or you got there if you want to try one too. So, um, so these have just been roasted um, and they're quite a crunchy sort of flavour. Um, some particularly kids um, say it's pop popcorn, bush popcorn. Um, so quite a nice flavour, very um, nutritious. Um, so per 100 grams of these, around 30% protein, 30 to 40%, wow. um, and around 20% fats. So avocado fats, like the good fats that are good for your brain and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So um, that's another thing when we start to look at our foods. And, and the... Um, introduced like yeah, it's a little bit crunchy is it yeah so you can see why it would have more have been ground into a flour because it it, it's a little exactly bit, like popcorn tastes exactly like popcorn yeah yeah so um but it does have you sort of get the casings in your teeth so um <laughs> if you ground it you get rid of all no that close stuff. Up shots yeah, now. yeah yeah that's right <laughs> um but i don't have time to, didn't have time this morning to um to ground them i mean you can use a coffee grinder um these days um whiz them up some people make them into drinks. Um, they've actually tried to be marketed as native coffee in the past. Um, Do they along work with the as, as a type of coffee? So I don't know if they have a caffeine in them. They taste like coffee, like the drink tastes like a coffee. I don't know if it has caffeine. I'd have to see who has researched into it whether they actually do or not um but yeah i don't think it ever took off as coffee <laughs> substitute <laughs> wattle seed sort of has um wattle seed is still out there today marketed as as like a native substitute yeah. for coffee um yeah but you know a lot of these foods um like i was going to mention like a lot of these leafy greens and stuff that you find um uh are very high in proteins and stuff you know so um you know and that's one of the things with our traditional plant foods you know like they were very high in protein as well so um so yeah so and, and adam traditionally yep. uh, fire and fire management was actually yep. a really crucial uh, part of kind of regeneration yes. as well yep. this one uh, just from my eye looks as though it's kind of been burnt and is that a part of this process? Um, so you can, when you collect these pods, um, you do need to get rid of these hairs. There's some hairs in there um, in the pods that are basically like a protection thing against birds and other things coming in and eating them all because they are so tasty. Um, so that kind of needs to be taken out because if you try and just eat them out like that, well, one, you're going to get all these spiky hairs in your fingers. 
And then two, you're going to get them in your tongue and they're kind of almost like cactus, sort of like trying to eat something like that. So, um, so fire in a cooking sense was important to get rid of those hairs. So you would, just burn them off. yeah, yeah. So you could bury it in with coals and stuff and just wait for them to cook yep. um, that way. Um, you know, I've spoken to some people these days with, you know, more modern technologies and stuff using like a jet flame and stuff, just do it like that, um, over that for five minutes. Retro retrofitting. Yeah, speeding that's it right, right up. speeding it right up. But <laughs> I basically these days just use a knife, scoop them out, um, make sure to get rid of all those hairs. So you can wear gloves, um, get rid of all the hairs, the po seeds come out of the pods. So uh, sorry, so these are the pods and they have like this protective casing that is the hairy stuff. You just get that out. The seeds separate really easily. Put them on a pan, cook them for, you know, about five to ten minutes in an oven on 180, 200 degrees. So, um, and that way, you know, you get rid of all the hairs, you get your resulting seed, then you can grind it up, you can do whatever you want or you can just eat it like sounds that. Like, sounds like nature is being super protective of this Yeah, one. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned fire too because, you know, a lot of our plants need fire to regenerate um, and traditional fire management's a really important tool. This is actually known as a water tree. So it holds water, it holds water in its... Um, you know, in the, the trunk, it holds water in the ground. It waters the rest of the plants around it. Um, and it will actually, um, it'll actually, you know, like if there's a big fire coming through, fires will often burn around this tree because it, it's, the water it holds content. so much water. Yeah, right. So, you know, when we're talking about like um, these, you know, quite disastrous fires we're seeing these days, um, you know, our landscapes have become more flammable. Um, in traditional times, we had water trees and fire trees and all that we knew all the different trees that and, and there were fire were important. There was fire yeah. management wasn't there? yeah like and the were, fire management there was yeah. the back burning process back, exactly that's right so um but you know these p trees are just as important to have in the landscape to um make it more you know more water in the landscape and less of the sort of flammable landscape so um you know farmers and that like this tree um particularly out west where I, my people come from, you see them just lopping the trees in the middle of a drought because they're the only thing that sheep have to eat, basically, yeah. the leaves. Um, the leaves are just full of moisture and, and vitamins and stuff. So, yeah, so they're a really important tree. Um, they've got a, a thousand uses. I could just sit here all day just talking about the uses of it, but probably the main thing is the seed. And then when they're really young, you can dig them up and they've got a long taproot that's a bit like coconut flavor so really nice um you can eat them straight out of the ground or roast them up so um yeah so that's the courage one that's a good one there you um, go uh, tracy what do you want to share with us next so i have here chickweed um, very common in disturbed sites and places with lots of moisture so they often pop up uh in your veggie patch or in shady spots so nutritionally, um, they're high in vitamins A and C and um, iron as well, uh, meant to be anti-aging. Oh. Um, chickens do love them. Um, they're quite good. And go for the young growth. So you can use the tops of the foliage in things like salads or cooking. Um, and they're um, being tested by US Department of Agriculture and they come in at the top five for the most um, nutritious plant. Um, dandelion was at number one. Um, I've made a pesto here with it um, this morning and it's quite a vibrant green. So I've got um, almonds and peanuts, olive oil, garlic, lemon juice, um, chickweed and I put a little bit of parsley in here as well so I find it's quite an earthy taste um, the chickweed quite fresh um, and you could also add um, parmesan cheese or something like that if you wanted to give it that creaminess but yeah I often how use much this. chickweed did you use for to make that so it was a decent handful so um, weight wise i don't think it'd be that much it's quite light maybe 30 or 40 grams but um the equivalent to what you'd get like a a bunch of rocket from the supermarket or something like that so yeah and, and you would have that with it i guess pastas or yeah absolutely so anything where you'd use a pesto and i use it on as a pizza base um, sauce as well. Um, yeah, you can dip breads in it. And yeah, it's really nice.
Yeah. And, and that one you would see popping up in your garden. Where else might you find that? Um, in um, parklands as well. So, yeah, I saw it when I was out walking this morning. <laughs> so it's pretty common. Yeah. You just foraged your way around camera Yeah, yeah today. I did. It was great. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Yeah, and, and uh, with that one, is it something that you could grow in your own garden? Yeah, like um, I did have it popping up in my veggie patch and I deliberately left it there so that I could harvest from it. And then what I don't use, I usually just um, chop and put it in my compost or I put it into the soil to help replenish the soil. Um, Obviously, these are quite nutritious plants, so they're good for the soil um, nutrition-wise, not just us. So, yeah, I do that. Yeah, great. Well, I'm looking yeah. forward to, tr- to trying that. Uh, Adam, what, what have you got for us next? Um, all right. Well, I guess I'll um, a couple of things that I foraged too just before on the way over. Um, so I'll, I might do t- the two together. Um, but basically, they look very similar. Um, a lot of them are landscaped all over the place. So we have Lamandra on this side. Um, bush rice, um, often known like that, uh, then kumbungi on the other side, which is the water one. Um, so, you know, both of them are kind of like vegetables. Um, that was what I sort of picked on the way in. It's from another l- species of lamandra, but it was just outside the building here. Um, and basically they collect, they um, they produce this seed um, from this lamandra. Now the lamandra, this one that I've got here, which gets landscaped everywhere, is actually the coast coastal variety. Um, so we have a similar one. We have the same species here, but they don't get as um, robust. So I think they prefer to use that one. Um, down on the coast, it's not uncommon to get seed off this for six months of the year, because really? um, it's quite temperate. Um, and, and that's the seed that, that, that's, you just, so that would come from inside that. You can see inside there, it's starting to poke out now. Um, so those seeds um, are another grain they are a little bit different to say wattle seeds and things like that that you can store and um, eat over the year Um, these need to be eaten fresh because otherwise they go hard as a rock Um, so if you want to lose some teeth you can eat them when you dry them but basically you eat them fresh Um, they're really good just to collect and chuck into a a cereal or something like that fresh Um, they've got a really nice sort of flavor Um, I've seen a, um, I remember an old elder, an Aragu man from uh, up Nimitabel Way. He would collect them, um, collect a bit of bush honey, mix it all together, make this like muesli bar type thing. It was really amazing. Well, yeah, yeah. So um, you got to eat, eat it quickly. You got to eat it quickly. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So although the honey will sort of stop it, will soften the seed a bit and stop it from getting too hard. So there were ways to mix things in with it to kind of prolong it, um, I guess. That base there, you can see, you can collect a whole bunch of it and you can cook it just like a vegetable. The, the um, white part. The white part, yeah. Or you can just eat it like that. So um, you can see there's quite a lot of um, starch in there. So this is a, um important carbohydrate, but it's also survival food. So you can get this all year round. If you have nothing else, and obviously there's quite a lot of stuff around, <laughs> yeah. but if you have nothing else, um, particularly in the bush, you will. This will keep you alive. This will keep you, give you carbohydrates. It'll give you water, um, and so you can almost see the water in it, the water content that it holds. Um, it's quite a tasty one. It's sort of got like a pea garden pea f- sort of flavour. Um, so yeah, so it is a good one to know. Um, it's a very good one for weaving. I can. So you, you can make a bit of rope and cordage from it. So it's quite strong then as it's well. It's quite strong. And the thing with this too, and what I tell a lot of people is um, you can make it green, like when it's fresh like this, you can pick it and start making yourself some rope. Um, and what will happen is it'll dry, it will shrink, but it gets tougher. So um, a lot of our plants that we make use as um, fibres, you need to like process first, you might need to harvest, you might need to dry and then re-soak and do all these um, things. With the lamandra, we can make it um, fresh as soon as we pick it. So it's a good one like on the go, if you need to make some rope really, really quick, um, you make it up, it's tough enough to then use as a rope, um, tie say, you know, something like a stone axe head to a um, handle, um, with some, you'd use some sap as well from different, some of our different trees that are like adhesives. 
Um, and then basically it will shrink and it'll sort of tighten it up even more. Um, or you could use it on tying up shelter really quickly. If you like a big storm comes over, you need to just, you know, tie yourself a bit of shelter or something. Well, if so that storm comes up, yeah, you don't want to be yeah, with you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Yeah. So um, the base of that, would, yep. you, would you chew on that if you're just wanting to get the water at contact? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yep. You just chew on it. Um, you just eat it, swallow it. Um, just don't go too much into the green. Because th- then you'll it'll be coming out the other side basically for 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 a bit. Yeah, um, right. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so, you, so our body won't really be able to digest the green component. No, no, it um, basically starts turning into a laxative once you get to the green bit. So, okay. um, so you just Steer clear. you just you, yeah, you just taste the um, especially if that storm's coming. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> exactly, mate. Um, so yeah, a similar again with the kumbungi. So the kumbungi has all these um, inner white um, bits at this time of year. So. Um, this is a really important plant too, and this is a, a universal plant. So every person in the world, uh, every one of our ancestors at some stage has used this plant. Um, it's everywhere. Um, for us, um, as Aboriginal people here um, in Australia, very, very useful plant. It's got um, all of that um, carbohydrates again in it um, at, in our spring period. Um, it has this big rhizome underneath. So it's a water plant. You can pick up pull out these big rhizomes um, underneath which are like the roots and you can pound out all the starch out of it and it like it's almost like a powdery sort of um, potato type flavor it's quite an interesting flavor um, so you can utilize you can get that all year round as well out of the water it might be a little bit um, hard going in winter like <laughs> standing in a pool of water to grab it um, because it actually dies back and you can see that's the old leaf it's died back and now it's shot out again some new shoots um, yeah, again, there's so many uses to it. Like with these new shoots, you can actually find some really useful gel stuff um, that's almost like a na- natural bongella type thing to numb um, teething and, and issues like that. Um, so you actually scoop it all out of the inner leaves um, and use it like that. Um, yeah, like I said, again, I could just be rattling off all the uses all day, but it's um, a really good one. It's one that we find all around the ACT. Um, you see it in all our waterways. Um, it almost takes over a lot of the waterways. And again, you know, talking to, I remember talking to an old um, Nangal elder, and I'm, um, unfortunately he's passed now, but he was a very knowledgeable man, and he used to talk about going fishing around here um, along the Malongolo River, and he would purposely burn these um, at the right time of year to get a good access but he would know it would come back and thrive um, um, in springtime for all the the animals and stuff um, and again that's really quite a skill to be able to burn um, around a waterway to ensure that the water doesn't get you know um, contaminated with ash and stuff but to get all the good um, charcoal um, and things to filter the water out and so again that was like a traditional practice a delicate and, a, balance, and a delicate balance yeah. to know how to actually do it um, the right way and um, you know a fire that you know moves slow enough to kind of have all the good balance of things but not to um, contaminate hold. our waterways yeah. and stuff so you know these are all these ancient practices that are really important things to know to make these plants thrive and all the animals that come in and eat them um, Lake George, there was a, um, around there, there was, which is a very special area, you know, that um, there was a, a settler that wrote quite a lot in his diary about the area. This, he said this was, it was just littered with this everywhere, the, the Kumbungi, and he would see women, particularly Aboriginal women, harvesting and harvesting and harvesting. Um, and he said that, you know, they would, you know, harvest it, manage it, but the amount of bird life that was in there, feasting off this like it was he, he was like it was almost like um you know you couldn't see in certain areas because it was just all bird life sort of thing through there you know so to imagine and to go back to that and to see something like that whereas you know half the time now it's not even full sort of thing um lake george so it's quite amazing to hear those old stories about it um so yeah there's actually and you might you probably got it here but there's actually another plant that used to be all around there that Aboriginal people would harvest, um, uh, the native sow thistle, and the introduced one's taken over quite a lot now, um, which you may have here, yes. but um, 
which I can yeah lead you on to yeah into that. <laughs> well, but perfect. <laughs> there's actually a native one that was um, used exactly the same way and was a really important food. Um, and it's still around, but it's in decline. So, so I might I'll pass it. Over to yeah, Tracy great. To keep going. Well, where, where do you want to take us <laughs> yeah. next, Tracy? I was thinking about showing you some books that I use that I thought would be really useful for people. Um, there's the Weed Forager's Handbook by Adam Grubb and Annie Razor Rowland. So they're from Victoria, so it's quite relevant to our climate here. And they showcase a lot of the um, common weeds around the place, um, ways of using them. And there's also some general information about um, identifying weeds, the to do's and don'ts and things like that. And um, it's readily available online. It's an excellent book. They've also got a website called Eat That Weed, um, which has got more photos and things like that on there. So I really like that. This one Adam would certainly be familiar with and remember, has contributed remember to. Remember working on it, yep. Yeah, so um, <laughs> this is uh, not all plant use. Um, so it's um, relevant to Canberra area and a lot of the edible foods, including the ones that Adam's been talking about in here. And you can get that from um, the Maggie's Visitors Centre. You can get it online. Um, you can probably get it at the Botanic Bookshops, places like that. So it's an excellent um, field guide too. It's quite sturdy. Um, and then this one here um, is a field guide to useful native plants for temperate regions. So it's divided up into different um, landscapes, coastal um, trees, things like that. And it's got not only um, what the plants are, where they grow and their size and things like that, but also their um, Aboriginal uses. So it's an excellent book as well. Do you find yourself, uh, depending on these, if you've, there might be something that pops up in the garden or that you spot and wonder, oh, hold on, I haven't seen that at that point or I'm not really familiar with it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely. I'll either um, get a small piece when I'm out or take a photo, something like that, if I don't have the books with me and then I, yeah, I'm straight onto them when I get back. Um, it's the first point of call for me. And then you can look online as well and find more information once you find out what it is. That um, weed forager, sorry, sorry to jump in, but yeah. that like that will open your eyes to what's in your garden if you're after going through yeah. that, eh? Like you're just like, oh, everything. Do, everything. do you yeah. depend on these ones as well? Oh, yeah. Like I mean, books are like really great guides. Part of yeah. <laughs> 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 They're really good guides. But yeah, like I just remember that one um, yeah. many years ago looking through that. And, like, I knew some of them in the garden, but then you're like, oh, what? Like, you've just got them all there, basically. Like, it's yeah. a really good guide, that yeah. one. So I recommend that one um, for yeah, people. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. Do you want to highlight something else that you've brought in as well? Yes. Um, I have here wild lettuce. I'm looking a little bit sad now. So I've got two pieces in here. This is a more mature part. Um, as they mature, they start to grow straight upwards and they get quite um, almost thorny on the sides. Um, when they're younger, um, they can look a little bit like a dandelion um, and they can even be a little bit um, of a rosetted and on the ground kind of shape. So to um, tell the difference between this and dandelion, um, on the underside of the leaves, there's some fine hairs that run along it. So it's quite distinct and makes it easy to recognise this plant. So it can be used um, as you would normal lettuce and you go for the really young ones. Um, once they get tall, they're bitter, just like a cultivated lettuce would be. Um, they're quite sturdy, so they hold up to um, light cooking as well, whereas lettuce wouldn't. So you can toss it in a stir fry and um, things like that. They've got um, really high nutrition and um, they've also got um, analgesic and sedative qualities. So the sap that you find in it when you snap it open. Um, yeah, so it's quite an interesting and useful plant that's um, out at the moment. Yeah, it sounds like it's got quite a few uses there yeah. as well. Yeah, it's quite versatile. So, yeah. Um, and a handy tip as well, like when you're out and you've correctly identified a plant, you can just try a really small piece of it and go, yes, this one tastes good. I'll grab that or how, no, How would you know bitter. if it tastes good? Is it the lack of a bitterness? Yeah, generally. Like, I mean, it's not unusual um, because they've got so much chlorophyll and they're so green, they are a little bitter and so dense in nutrients. 
but um yeah they're more palatable um yeah some things when they're older they just taste really intense and you're not going to enjoy it at all mm. so yeah mm. uh, adam what, what have you got for us next oh well, i might um give you guys a little taste of this um which i don't know how again how affected it's been with the fires but i used to see quite a lot of this up um, I was ma- mentioning to Tracy, like around um, Burumba Rocks and up in the Magi National Park, um, and you find it in the in the creek areas. So I've got um, the more sort of common one al- along the rivers, which is uh, river mint, um, and that one, you know, a lot of nurseries are selling it now, and things you can go and buy it. It's it's related to the mints that you'd go and buy in the shop, same as this. Um, uh, it has a quite a bigger leaf than this, as you can see. Um, so both of them are local species. Um, you get this um, in pockets around the Malongolo, but they do get outcompeted um, by the introduced sort of um, things that come in. So they've been quite outcompeted, but you can, if you get lucky, still find them around parts of our river. Um, and then this one, I it may be more widespread. I've, I've only ever sort of seen it more in the mountainous areas where they're sort of... Um, you know, the water runs off down the mountains. You get a little sort of creaking and, and running um, water. Um, so I might give you guys a try of this if you want, if you want to pick a leaf. Um, so it's quite a sort of spear minty. Maybe crush it up, have a bit of a smell first. Um, it's quite a potent sort of um, one. So oh, it's really strong. Yeah. And then um, as a flavor, it's quite nice. So it could be used like with fish or um, in, in a cooking just to season your foods yeah. and things like that. With our mints, they are very, very good for us um, internally. So like, you know, the mint that you might have growing in your yard, good for your digestion, um, digestive system. Um, the river mint in particular, it's often good when you've got the sinus headache and you crush it and inhale it. Um, so it, it'll sort of um, just quite relieve that, that the sinuses and the, and the headaches that are associated with it. Um, but really you know when you're feeling a bit crook you you feel it uh, you know when you feel it sort of coming on that cold or something like that you start to make what we, what we call jiri in radri which is tea um of something like this and it fixes you up pretty quick like um it'll it'll sort of you know like it it'll, it'll make it not as long lasting basically your colds and stuff so you can still get it. it take the edge off yeah so it's quite a useful plant for um for that kind of thing too same as this um for you know your colds and um respiratory issues and things like that as well so they're really really good um medicines they were you know looked at which all our foods were as well our foods were medicines but you know these are kind of looked at as medicines uh, um not just sort of herbs as well that you cooked with so um so yeah so um you know quite a nice sort of tasting one um that you can grow easily i mean look this one's going pretty well in a little pot here <laughs> it's um, very happy the river mint you know as well um can get pretty out of control in your garden just like a mint if you've put it in the ground so you might want to keep it in a pot um i've got it in the ground though i don't mind it going out of control so um because i pick enough of it sort of thing you can pick it and dry it and use it later as well just like a herb so um any herb so it's good like that i've had some i do a lot of work in schools and that teaching um young yeah, and i have a lot of teachers say oh i'd probably be good in a mojito or in in, in my gin <laughs> cocktail or whatever at night too so whatever sort of place <laughs> however, there, you, want but yeah, however it. you want to use it so uh, Trace, yeah. we might, we've got time for probably one more and then we might open it up to some questions questions sure so i've got here mallow plant or it's also known as marshmallow plant uh, can also be known as cheese wheel and that's because of the the seed heads they're segmented and look like um, a wheel of cheese uh, they get a um, small uh, pink flower on them they're related to um, plants such as hibiscus so these have a like a mucilage in them um, so they can help to um, relieve you when you've got coughs and colds and things like that. Um, so you go for the younger leaves. They can be used raw or cooked, um, chop them up. Um, so it's quite a good one. It can get quite big. They really did well this last season. I saw some over a metre tall. They're quite spectacular. Um, they have a really deep tap root so um, a lot of plants that have a deep tap root can mine a lot of nutrition from deep in the soil so they're quite nutritious 
Um, so they can be handy um, chopped up into your compost as well or in the garden. Um, and if you don't want them to self-seed, um, just remove those mature heads. Um, they're used a lot um, in a lot of cuisines, including back in ancient Roman times. So this plant has been around for a very long time um, and still used today. So good spinach substitute. Where'd you find that yeah. one? Um, so this was on my little walk. Um, so yeah, I only <laughs> walked about, I don't know, uh, 300 metres from my house and I mm. found all these things. So, you must have yeah. to take a big bag out when yeah. you go for a wander. <laughs> yeah, I need a trolley. <laughs> yeah, it gets a bit heavy. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but, wonderful. Um, thank, yeah. thank you. Uh, I wonder if we have any questions, if anything's uh, burning. We've covered a lot of ground, well, just in a couple of hundred metres as it was. Who wants to kick us off? Oh, hi there. My name's Priscilla. Um, I've got a question for Adam. I was interested when you were talking about the lamandra, how that was burned, and that made me think of if the birds and things are eating it, would Aboriginal people have cultivated and managed the plants to attract other animals as a source of food, as a, a source of protein? So would, like, I'm not thinking of anything in particular, but maybe like a, a particular grass that they knew wallabies would eat. Is that something that would have happened? Yeah, definitely. Um, happened with uh, a number of species. So, um, obviously, burning um, the grasslands would then provide new green pick for kangaroos and make them more predictable um, where they are um, to hunt um, and drive them into areas. Um, one that I can think of comes to mind um, locally as well is the silver wattle. So the silver wattle um, is an important food, um, plant food, um, but it's also important habitat for the sugar glider and the sugar glider was um, traditional food as well. So what would be done is um, by burning, um, you would actually create these thickets of the silver wattle um, because the silver wattle can spread quite like quite far and um, get quite um, almost weedy in a sense um, but by burning them and sort of controlling them into large um, thickets um, one that would kind of control them in a sense but it would also um, then provide that habitat for the sugar glider because the sugar glider comes to them um, and scratches into um, the, the bark to get the sap out um, and so it would actually make them predictable like you would know each night where to go because they're you know, nocturnal um, animals, you would know by just going to your thickets where they would be and where, where you could hunt them sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it was very much um, animal by animal. You sort of would almost create the habitats for them and stuff so you knew and where they were and how and they were easy to obtain. Um, you know, when I think of in our river systems, um, that was why fishing, fish traps and stuff was such an important thing because you would actually funnel the right types of fish into certain areas to make them really easy to catch and then you would use certain plants that actually stun fish um, to make them really easy to you basically scoop them out of the water um, and so the fish trap system was important because it would be made in, a, in such a way that you would only funnel the mature fish that are ready to eat into those areas and the other immature fish would um, go out the other ends of the fish traps back into the system um, and then would be there for later on, um, you know, once they're mature. Because it was so, the other hole at the other end that they could get yeah, through. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So um, you could actually make, you make um, fish traps from these as well, eel traps and things, and that's using that system, yabbies, yabby traps, all that sort of stuff, you make it from this stuff as well. Um, so, yeah, it was quite an um, important um, thing to know but that's a really good question and yeah no, the, all these habitats were sort of created so y your food was a lot easier and abundant as well you wanted your food to be abundant um, so and part of managing yeah. those cycles I'm yep. imagining as well exactly right yep uh, do we have another question you just down the front here uh, hi my name's Mel um, my question is about pests because in a lot of um, you know the gardens that you grow um, you tend to have things like aphids that will sort of um, contest for the food with you and I'm just wondering with some of the natives if they maybe have a different sort of pest that you have to watch out for or how you would identify like whether or not it's like good to eat. Good, really, really good question. I have seen some um, of our native plants um, get affected by aphids as well so um, 
yeah, so that is something sometimes that you need to look out for. Um, I think for a lot of our plants, um, well, the bigger growing plants anyway, like um, if you're looking for fruits or seeds and stuff, you're going to be battling with birds. Birds are going to be your biggest <laughs> pest, but you kind of want to let them go to them too and have, have their food. Um, so like, you know, your cockatoos, your rosellas, all that sort of stuff you're going to have to sort of compete with, with magpies. Magpies absolutely love courage on. Um, and often if I'm doing a talk and I pull out courage on seed, they all come in. <laughs> and so I've got to feed them too and then feed the group sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so I, I think in terms of like, I wouldn't really see them as pests, but they're a bit of a competition in that sense. Um, but I have seen, yeah, some plants, I suppose, in a garden setting, then become... Um, some native plants then become susceptible to aphids and things that you find more in your gardens that are attacking your tomato plants and stuff like that. So it can definitely happen to some of our native plants as well. I don't um, have any sort of natural things that I can think of off the top of my head that might sort of help to get rid of them, um, eradicate them. You, I don't know if Tracy... Yeah, probably, you um, possibly the native mint bush. The mint things bushes, with, yeah. Um, yeah, potent, more potent. Um, mm -hmm. yeah saps in them and things are often used to help uh, repel um, pests in the garden. Because your mint's often used for minties or sandflies and, and some mosquitoes even, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so, and weeds are actually handy because um, a lot of pests quite like them. So you could see them as a decoy plant. Um, the aphids are going to feed on a nice lush um, bit of dandelion instead of something um, in your veggie patch. Yeah, yeah. So ha having the balance or creating that environment in your own garden perhaps. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot to be said for diversity yeah. and having a variety of plants. That way um, you're getting wildlife in that are going to feed on these pests. Um, you're also, um, yeah, it's just going to be a lot more balanced, um, a lot more input from you, less input from you, sorry and um, the pest problems are usually smaller and you don't need to necessarily do anything with them. Um, it's dealt with naturally then, yeah. There you go. Uh, we've probably got time for one more question, I think. And there must be somewhat, something, a burning question that someone had. Just down the front here. Um, Adam and Tracy, um, with um, sort of this season we're in at the moment, what do you recommend as a good natural um, remedy for sinus issues? Um, well, uh, there's a few things. I've got a tea that I brewed um, from peppermint gum. So peppermint gum eucalyptus. And how we do it is um, we generally harvest and um, let th the leaf dry. Um, and by doing that, um, again, we make dairy tea. Um, and it has a really good balance of the oils without it being overbearing, um, you know, or any toxins in it either. So um, by drying the leaf, it um, just gives you the really good balance of all those things and it helps the sinus. It'll it release everything out of the sinus and things. I mean, there are, there are a lot of plants I, I could probably <laughs> recommend for sinus. With um, that one, do you have to yep. be a little bit careful about the oil content of, of the leaves? So I get this question a lot, um, you know, when you're using particularly dried leaf and you compare it to eucalyptus oil that's in a bottle sold at Woolworths, it's very, very concentrated, that oil, compared to what you're using um, from your leaf. So um, so generally a rule of thumb, like particularly with the peppermint gums and that is like, you can use it fresh, but it does, the tannins and stuff get quite overbearing um, over time, whereas if you dry it, um, it just has a really good balance. And that's generally how we've sort of just done it um, over many, many generations and there. what about so the steaming? Because you know how you yeah. can have the kind of uh, steam, steam yeah, vapour. Yeah. Yep. Would you would you use something like the pepper gum and potentially yep. use the fresh? Yeah, you use the fresh leaves for st any sort of steaming, any sort of smoking um, stuff, you know. So that's another thing you can do too, um, is just inhale it um, and it works really, really well for the sinus issues. Um, and things um but yeah you want fresh leaves generally for um any of that um with our sort of smoking um you know that's a really important traditional practice people see it um ob obviously today um happening but you know it's a really important practice to basically um heal 
spiritually, mentally, and physically. It heals everything. That's that's how we look at it. Um, as so, you're sort of doing the three layers of healing. Well, that's the significance of smoking ceremonies, yeah, isn't it? It's that's cl- right. It's cleansing, but also self-healing. Yeah, that's right. And you know, one of the biggest and most important ceremony or smoking ceremonies is actually when it's the, the babies at birth because that sets them up for life that gives them that strength of all those three layers that i mentioned um so that's probably one of the most important ones traditionally was the babies um being held over the the smoke of the eucalyptus in part of a ceremony so yep yeah uh, tracy i wonder if you want to weigh into that question about uh, the sinuses and and from the kind of health perspective i guess yeah so whorehound uh, it's actually in the mint family, so it can be used to, um, for mucousy coughs and things like that, and it's um, used as a tea, um, so you can use that. There's the mallow plant as well, which I showed you earlier, so that's um, good for coughs and colds and things as well, um, so they're quite good. Um, pretty much any of them. Will they, help they will have with the, those it's, things. What's the yeah. balance thing that you've both touched on, isn't it, about having uh, that balance in your body just right uh, and the medicinal component must shine through on that? Mm, yeah, definitely. I do um, definitely agree with the mallow. I've, I've used that a couple of times when I haven't had time to go up and get peppermint gum because I'd just be growing in my backyard and it's really good for the respiratory system. It'll just like any sort of cough or anything by then drinking a few cups of that the next day, it's almost gone pretty much like it's really good stuff um as a substitute if you can't you know get up get other things or aren't confident with finding things out there sort of thing because it's generally in most people's gardens yeah, there these days, easy so to recognize easy to recognize yeah. yeah so um but yeah mints as well are good for sinus generally like probably the, the native but but also the introduced ones so yeah, there's lots of things out there i guess <laughs> so could go all day really yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, well, so thank you both so much. We were right you, up against right, the you. clock. I appreciate you both uh, sharing all of your insights and uh, having such a dynamic conversation about what's around us in the environment. So thank you both so much. Thank nice. you. Thank <laughs> you. And thank you very much for being involved in Floriad Reimagined. Do check out the website Floriad Australia for more information and to keep the conversations going. Yara, thanks for your time.